uh, that's everything from the uh, trade frames that are posted. Uh, just a hat tip to Rich and Ken H. and Chi Wing Chong for supporting the team with their due diligence and their collaborative learning. Um, just really, really powerful stuff. Um, uh, what I'm going to say on, um, on Monday, just to give you a heads up for some of that stuff. These are some of the charts that I'm putting together. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking about these big topics. Why do we care about critical states in trading? I'm going to really reinforce that. I'm going to talk about how to develop a coach's eye. And uh, that was uh, that really intrigued Van a lot today at the, at lunch when I was describing the work I've been doing on um, on coaching. See, I take the uh, I take the high school high school soccer team model uh, approach to coaching. There's a lot of other models. There's sort of uh, business executive coaching, the usual. There's army coaching, which is part of our leader development model, which is very structured and formal. And it is informed by a very strong hierarchy and rank and a conservative culture. But that's a legitimate model. There is the instructional coaching model that's used in uh, in education a lot and what that one says is, is if you have a master coach and that person is coaching the teacher who is teaching the students right so this is a teacher this is a master teacher what happens is is the practice that we're trying to improve is the way the teacher coach is teaching the student or the uh, or the player or the trader and so the instructional coach has expertise in the skills that the student is trying to learn but also has skills in the teaching and also has skills in coaching so what we're trying to do is pass on the coaching qualities the skills to be a good coach in this instructional coach so that it improves the teacher's teaching because that we're going to help work on the skills that you're using to impart to the student but we're also going to help that teacher develop a coaching mindset so that the relationship between student and teacher becomes more like the high school soccer coaching so the way we do that is um, when I'm coaching my high school soccer players the very first thing that I recognize is that my players don't have to play for me. All right? They're choosing to play. So the first thing I want to know is why do you want to play soccer and what are your goals? What's your motivation? Because I want to understand. So I ask them that question so that I can understand their motivation, you know, their goals and purposes. And what do they want to get out of this? you know for the future what's that future state look like because I have seen futures in soccer and leadership and I may be able to help them see various futures that now soccer playing and leadership and teamwork is simply one means to get to their direct goals but also can support them with life goals so one of the things that the coach can bring to this relationship is the vision of other possible futures as well but it starts with an understanding of what future does the player see and what is that energy of motivation that makes them want to play maybe they haven't even sorted out things like goals and objectives and purpose and if i see that i can say hey let me talk to you about how we can make goals that will help you in your stair step to get to these various futures and let me use guided questioning to help elicit from you some of these different possible futures and so in that way by starting with the players point of view and asking those good questions about purpose and motivation then we can help 
craft a collaborative path for the player to build towards that future. Well, the next step in that thing is to say, is I ask the player, I say, um, I want you to imagine the ideal relationship for you between you and me, between you and your coach. What, and so I ask the player, I say, uh, what qualities do you want to see in your coach? So I ask the player, what do you want to see in me that you think would help you develop more as a player? And then I ask them, uh, look at uh, what kind of, uh, I, I ask them to say, now adopt the point of view of a coach and say, if you were a coach and all my high school players are going to be coaches for me because they help me coach the younger kids, I say, hey, part of your professional development here, part of your soccer player development is to help me teach the younger ones how to be like you because you're an amazing player. So when we're when we're running that soccer camp and you're helping me with our um, with our practices in the academy, what kinds I want you to think like a coach and say, what kinds of qualities do you want to see in those subordinate players? Oh well coach, they listen, they pay attention, they try hard, they have fun, they're good teammates, and uh, all that stuff. And I say, all right. Now I've helped them adopt a coaching mindset, a coaching point of view. They are working on developing a coach's eye about players. And I say, now that you put that together, you now have a checklist to assess yourself as a player. I said, you know, just think back to how you are as a player in practice and in games and with your teammates. And how would you score yourself on the qualities that you say you would want to see in a player if you were a coach. And then I say, evaluate those qualities that you want to see a coach. Evaluate me, because I'm going to think about how well do I meet those qualities that you're looking for. So what we're doing is between the coach and the player is that we are defining the terms of reference, the frame of reference, and now we have an open exchange of information as two members of the same team, each playing their own particular role, but now what we're doing is building a collaborative culture that defines the relationship between the things that we're going to judge on the basis of the things that we say are important. So when you start putting all that together, you start building a collaborative learning and growing and coaching and playing environment that has each of us contributing to the co-creation of that learning and developmental space. Well, that's what I call the high school soccer coaching model of coaching. And that is actually different in some important ways with traditional business executive coaching and with the army coaching model and the instructional coaching between a master teacher and a teacher. Because in that one, we expect the master teacher to know what needs to be done and to have broken down the skills of teaching into all these learnable pieces and then send these pieces over to the, to the teacher and then say, hey, I'm going to teach you how to do this and then I'm going to observe you doing it and give you feedback about how you're doing it. But you can see that this is kind of a one-way instructional model. Now, that's a very effective way to break down the tasks of teaching so that they can get better, but it doesn't necessarily require that same kind of collaborative relationship that you see between a player and a coach on the soccer field. So what I'm doing is putting together um, a course and lessons that examine what we mean by a coaching eye and that's going to incorporate things from business executive coaching, army coaching, instructional coaching, high school soccer coaching, and then a fifth model, which is called the protreptic, pro 
streptic, which is a Greek word, which comes from the tradition of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. That's how those guys trained the philosopher kings uh, of ancient Greece, like Alexander the Great. And it is a particular style of coaching that looks more like high school soccer coaching than any of these other models. Because what it does is it, it sets up the protreptic coach and the and the partner or the person that's being coached. And, and then the partner comes into the discussion space with something that they want to work on. And then through a series of guided so Socratic questions, open-ended, the partner explores what we mean, what that what that person means by those things inside their own frame of reference. And the protreptic coach is really just like Diogenes the wise man or whatever, is just shining a light, you know, uh, let me try to draw like some kind of light bulb, and so it's shining a light onto this, onto the things that the partner brought into the space. So in this sense, it's collaborative, but the protreptic coach doesn't pretend to be an expert on all of those things that the partner's bringing in. Like in high school soccer coaching, I am an expert in soccer. And instructional coaching for teachers in a professional setting, I'm an expert. But protreptic coaching takes on the qualities that says the partner is the subject matter expert in whatever issue it is that they're working on. That's where the expertise arises. And the role of the protreptic coach is simply to be a good sounding board and illuminator and a person with integrity and critical thinking and critical creative questioning that helps shed light for the partner on the issue that's being brought into the coaching circle. So the coaching course I'm going to put together for Van and the Tharp Institute and, and, and our folks in our community of practice is how to do that stuff. Well, one of the ways that you can engage in that protreptic coaching circle is, um, is to adopt the principles of true storytelling. So let me show you, since I'm here, What we do in the true storytelling circle, let me uh, zoom in on this a little bit more, is that in true storytelling, and this is the workshop that Ken H. and I are going to be attending, and I'm bringing in five or six uh, senior Army leaders to work with us, as well as the other folks from South America and Europe. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at how to create a true story circle and it begins with establishing safety so that the things that happen in this sacred story space are protected and that the people who enter and go through like a foyer and a coffee talk and then and then enter a sacred story space in which the people in that circle are exchanging personal stories with emotional impact about whatever story seed that we're talking about. And then in that sacred story space, when people are in that and shedding light on the into that space, everybody's bringing in personally significant and meaningful things that are... And then the act of sharing that makes this a sacred story space. We don't record it. We don't give feedback or guidance or recommendations or advice we are simply there to witness each person telling that sacred story for the first time and letting that story breathe and just letting it be what it is and then when we are done exchanging those important stories and then we go into the foyer and coffee talk and debrief and whatever, and then it inevitably turns out that the things that we've shared in that story space end up coming back to us in ways that are enlightening and that help us see other opportunities in the world, which could be done in workshops or the building of tools or in collaborations. 
But it's the sacred story space built on safety, trust, truth that leads to the opportunities. And when you have a shared sacred story space together, it allows you to do things like um, circumnavigate the elephant. So when we talk about circumnavigating the elephant in the true story tradition, what we mean is that you, the person, with your own expertise and knowledge of your head, heart, gut, hands, and feet, you approach the sacred story space and opportunities can depart in any direction. And in that sacred story space, what's happening is all of these things that you can stay in that roundabout, that place of safety, trust, and truth, and then all of these are words, which leads to big, <laughs> those are returns. Well, suppose as a result of that, you saw an opportunity to do something complex. And that's, I render that as the elephant. And I don't know if you've ever seen an elephant, especially if you're a blind man, you haven't seen an elephant. But one of the things that we're trying to understand is the complexity and the totality of an elephant. And if you're this person, all you can see is through your aperture. You know, you can see that much of the elephant. You can't see that stuff over here. But if you were in a collaborative learning space with people that had grown up with you and established safety, trust, and truth and the opportunities to get better together, then you could actually circumnavigate the elephant with trusted others. And because you have the ability to exchange stories with truth and honesty and integrity, then what you have is not a collection of individuals around, but you actually have a learning network of collaborative, cooperative teammates, a mastermind. And then you can simultaneously see that elephant from many different directions and then see what might be done. Now, if you don't have that collaborative network of people, what you have to do if you really want to understand the elephant is you have to see it from your point of view, deliberately offset, gain expertise in this perspective, and then look at the elephant, and then move, and look at the elephant from this angle, and move, and look at the elephant from that angle, move, see the elephant from that angle. And it takes time for you to develop the expertise in looking at the elephant through this point of view because if you're an amateur you're going to get it wrong so you have to spend some amount of time in each one of these locations in order to develop a confident coherent view of the elephant from that point of view and it takes time to travel and when you're traveling and learning this point of view all you're doing is maintaining a memory of what it was like over here, but time has passed, and go. guess what? The elephant is moving. It's dynamic and changing. So if it took five years for you to develop these other points of view, it takes five years to develop expertise in the professions in the world. you got to get a master's degree and have a couple years of practice under the tutelage of a mentor to really have effective technical knowledge in the world. If you did that five times, it might take you 25 years to circumnavigate the elephant. And how much could the market change in 25 years while you're trying to develop those points of view and expertise? A much more efficient way to do that is to establish a comprehensive, collaborative, trustworthy network of people who are in it for each other's benefit as well as their own. And in that mutual exchange, you have a mastermind effect that allows you to begin to appreciate the elephant. I am convinced we don't ever understand the elephant because the market is too complex anyway, but we can appreciate many things about the elephant. And what you're seeing, even with tonight's little podcast, was that trust relationship between Chi Wing Chong and Ken H to share trade frames. You see Ken H offering you safe trustworthy trade frames that are his and he's sharing that with you 
to show you what the power of that mastermind, but also to encourage you to do the same. So when I ask you to post your charts so that you can get feedback, it's not just so that I can give you feedback so you can develop expertise yourself from your point of view, although that's primary what I'm doing, but it's also in the way that I give that feedback and other people can hear it, and you have the courtesy to share those lessons with others, that I'm teaching one, but I'm actually teaching many to look through that lens. And so in that way, as you participate in the chat room or in your small learning groups, in any form, it doesn't have to be in the chat room, but you find trusted others, if you can imbue those relationships with safety, trust, and truth, then you will be astounded at the number of opportunities that will emerge to leverage the power of the elephant trading and the markets to do work. That elephant wants to work. He can change the world and you can harness that power with respect for the elephant and treating the elephant well. And that's the kinds of reflections we get in our roundabouts. And it turns out that this point of view that I call circumnavigating the elephant um, I made a presentation on this at the International Society for Organizational Development and Change to about 300 scholars of organizational change management, and they're knocking down my door to figure out how they can do this and how they can learn to do that. So the workshop that I'm going to do with Ken H. and the folks at uh, True Storytelling Institute um, is part of that being unrolled. So. The combination of this plus that coaching information is going to be part of the developmental program that um, I'm going to do through uh, VTI, also myself, but also with VTI. And that's one of the things Van and I um, were talking about. One of the things that actually happens when you do this, and so, since we're here and I'm just going to share it anyway, um, is that if you just did a top-down view of that sacred story space, right, and that whole process. Um, if you only think in two dimensions, sometimes it feels when you're in the story circle, you're just going around in circles. And the reason you do that in the roundabout is so you can do all those R words like rest, recover, relate, restory, repurpose. Uh, and then you feel like, well, I'm going to go then do workshop. I'm going to go to my own workshop to work on myself or develop tools to help me work on myself or in the world. But what's actually happening is if you adopt a three-dimensional point of view, is you realize that what you're doing is when you're going around that circle in a positive way and you're raising energy of truth, you're actually spiraling around this thing and you're gaining new perspectives and height. And what used to look like obstacles you get taller than that and you realize, oh, that thing is just narrow and I can look over that into opportunities that this was blocking when I was down here. Or if I'm going this way and then this wide obstacle is blocking me, once I get altitude, I can see, oh, there's ways around that to get into those opportunities. So what happens in the story space is things that were blocking you from your own point of view, you start hearing stories from others that gives you ideas about how you can collaborate and learn from that through reflection. When you hear the truth of others and how they've overcome obstacles and seized opportunities and you partner with people, you get so many new ideas and possibilities and opportunities that you just can't stand it. I mean, it's just, as long as you just approach this in sort of a gentle but relentless effort, you just keep spiraling your way up the hill Pretty soon you and your team sees nothing but opportunities because the obstacles diminish. Those obstacles cannot possibly contain you and the energy that is released is generated in these sacred story spaces. The act of creating a sacred story to come in and share generates energy for you. When you tell that story, it releases even more energy to you. And then you can repurpose that energy to create tools, or seize opportunities in your own workshop or attending other workshops or trade, whatever. The workshop 
is the place where work is done. I'm not saying that as a you know educational work, but where you're doing the work of your life is you bring tools and technique into that place of work, and then you go change the world with the energy and the insights that come from that sacred story space. This is unbelievably powerful stuff, guys. So when we talk about the specifics of the true storytelling process, which is what Ken H. is going to learn, Dr. Boji, who's my uh, doctoral mentor for the last 20 years, and I'm a postdoc student for him, helping him document what he means by true storytelling. He identifies seven um, principles of true storytelling. It starts with the truth of the stories that are there. You then learn to make space for the stories of others as long as your own. And then you examine the plots and you learn how to deconstruct those and you find alternate plots that can explain the same thing but in new ways and for repurposing and that's where the opportunities come from and then you apply timing so that you can phase those plots into certain checkpoints and now you can jump to a new area and jump over obstacles and then you tell those stories in chapters and phases that's what timing does is expands the plot into long-term programs of action and then you learn how to ask for help along the way and you get it from your mastermind because you're offering other people help they just offer you help and we go along together and then staging is how we construct a supporting ecosystem that allows us to perform these stories along the way and staging is what you do to set yourself and your team up for success by creating conditions in which success can occur and then the final stage of reflection is how you take all of that stuff and bring it into a cycle of learning and then restoring and you tell that into the next roundabout as a sacred story and then that leads through safety trust truth and it leads to other opportunities and now you start getting iterations of going from story circle to story circle to story circle in a chosen path of restoring and repurposing your life that's consistent with your values and the change that you want to make in the world uh, my experience with this over the last five years has just been um, life-changing and um, here's an example that I can talk about um, about when I applied these principles to my own trading and business and education and teaching practice um, that I was able to take the existing stories that were important to me and then learn how to expand them and repurpose and so that's a working example that I'll offer to those guys and uh, that I'm happy to share in a true story circle with folks that are interested so this will be part of the uh, stuff that I talk about on Monday and part of the new body of knowledge and whatnot that I'll be bringing to the Tharp Institute and our own practice uh, but that's why mastermind groups are powerful and that's what I mean about developing a coaching eye and we know from today's work about the importance of critical states and then what to do when you have a hunch oh you just do this you frame the trade in the usual way and build out the standard structure for decision making and you trust and respect the hunch because it comes from some place that's important and the preparation as you've heard me talk about endlessly is more important than the planning the preparation is what you do about the plan so that you can set it up for success and that's kinda goes along with what you do when you have a hunch well you prepare to exploit the hunch and so some of the other things that I'll talk about are little snapshots of lessons that we've learned um, in COVID like why that turning point is so crucial the dragon has moved and started to reverse and you get the PSAR flip. That's the operational space right in there for the SSC. And then if you put a little more effort into it, you could see that with specific indicators that we use to build out the trade frame that allows us to exploit that trade in a standard, standard way and that we're not afraid of doing the work because we know that work will set you free. And that's what three generations of coal miners uh, look like um, proud men working for their families 
saw themselves as artisans and technicians, and they accepted their life and made a better life for their families through that hard work and application. So, and that's where I, mentally I go to refresh and reset and do my reflective thinking. That's a rock on the Pacific Ocean out there in Monterey that used, um, when I was teaching out there, on every weekend I would go down there and climb that and then sit on the top and listen to the whales and watch the ocean and uh and just think about things and that's my reflective space and uh that's that's my mental theater my visualization of that space and i can smell the the ocean salt and hear the whales and remember what it feels like to walk in bare feet along that and then put my shoes on and climb that climb that it's a lot easier than it looks you know the, the easy way up is here and then you walk the spine but uh, um, pretty nice place on the planet of earth um, and then this is kind of what we uh, this is what we do here we, we trade in the usual way and sometimes good things happen to us and if you have this uh, what would be your plan how would you manage this trade if you were entered here with your initial risk and it broke out above the VWAP and got above the Z3 and ran all the way up here on um, uh, going into the close. This is at the end of the day. And you got that nice move. It was a VWAP magnet and beyond. How would you manage that trade? That's what it looks like intraday, but you've seen enough examples of that from Ken H's that that could just as easily have been a swing trade with exactly the same behavior, and your interpretation and your response to it should be identical. The only thing that's different is the time cycle between each next bar. Sometimes that's a day chart. Sometimes that's a weekly chart. Uh, sometimes that's a minute chart. The decision making is identical. The interpretation uh, of the indicators and the trade framing is identical. And you know, my my goal in life is to hope to put you into positions like this where you suffer with what to do with that position. I hope you suffer like that every day of your trading life. That and if that happens, if you get to experience that kind of suffering then I will have done my job and I will feel content okay so you guys have just seen um, you know some of the most important parts of that uh, of that briefing that I'm going to give on uh, uh, on Monday I've only got an hour to do that and this took me 40 minutes so it feels like I could probably get through that this was the other piece that I briefed Van on and that is how to incorporate the insights of Angus Fletcher's teachings reliable teachings to raise creativity 70 80 percent is the way that we continue we will continue to generate innovative ideas in the future in a world that is filled with elephants that are changing and dynamic and so this is a model that uh, I'm installing into the army so they can understand how to what to do with innovation what to do when you have a hunch well, you evaluate it on these two dimensions. That's what you do. So I'm working with Angus Fletcher on that to develop that into a, um, a nice program of uh, action. That's going to be part of that developmental program I do with the uh, Tharp Institute, too, um, formal coaching. So it's time to get on with that. All right, that's everything I got for you. Thanks for hanging in there and uh, playing along. And I really uh, genuinely appreciate the support and your willingness to uh, to share and support the team and to learn in public uh, with the folks in this community of practice. The more you do that, the better you're going to be and the stronger that mastermind will become. And uh, as I teach you to look through a coach's eye, you won't need me to be your coach because you will be a coach of yourself and a coach for your peers and your partners in your trading circle your accountability circle, and then uh, I'd be happy to join them and be there, but you won't need me to be that self-actualized learning team. And you will change the world if you do that. I guarantee it. So hear me now and believe me later. Take good care, guys. 
Uh, that's everything I wanted to cover for tonight, and uh, we will see you tomorrow for the uh, trade framing, uh, for the day trade frames and whatnot, and um, looking forward to that. Take good care. Hopefully you found that interesting. Um, uh, I'll stick around for a few minutes. I'm going to stop the recording.